What's up guys and welcome back to Wall Street Millennial. If you've been paying attention to the stock market, you may have seen the embattled Chinese property developer Evergrande continue to freefall with its stock price losing another fifth of its value in the past 5 days. Ratings agency S&P says that the company is likely to default and also cut its credit rating on other property developers in the country. The downfall of Evergrande seemed to come out of nowhere, with the stock price declining more than 90% in just the past year. Institutional investors including BlackRock, HSBC, and UBS were loading up on the company's debt in the months leading up to the collapse. But for more than a decade, there have been obvious red flags around the company's precarious financial structure, corporate mismanagement, and shady business dealings. As early as 2012, famous short seller Andrew Leff was sounding the alarm on Evergrande, saying that the company was fraudulently understating its liabilities and was on the brink of insolvency. By that time, Evergrande was already an extremely influential company in China and Hong Kong. Taking them head-on was not going to be easy. In 2016, the Hong Kong financial authorities found Left guilty of market misconduct and said that his allegations against Evergrande were false and misleading. He was fined millions of dollars and banned from trading Hong Kong listed stocks for five years. Andrew Left has taken a lot of flack for his disastrous GameStop short position earlier this year. While his call on Evergrande turned out to be premature, he turned out to be dead right in the end. In this video, we'll go over Left's 2012 short report about the company, the Hong Kong government's crusade against him, and how Evergrande was able to stay afloat for so long before finally collapsing. In 2012, Andrew Left's Citron Research published a report accusing Evergrande of hiding its debts and engaging in illegal business practices. At this point, they had only publicly traded for a few years and had a market cap of about 9 billion US dollars. Many investors wanted to get a piece of the red hot Chinese real estate market and Evergrande looked like the best way to play this. Between 2006 and 2011, their assets increased more than 20-fold, far outpacing the growth of their peers. But Left thought he found accounting irregularities that they used to overstate their assets and understate their liabilities. After adjusting for these, he said their book equity value was negative 36 billion RMB, while the company was reporting equity of positive 35 billion on their balance sheet. Additionally, he alleged that they bribed government officials to buy land for their developments at below market prices. And finally, he claimed that they used a Ponzi-like financing structure, where they rely on growing pre-sale down payments to finish existing products and service their debt load. All of these factors led Left to make the conclusion that the company was fraudulent and would eventually collapse. He initiated a short position and published a report in the summer of 2012, immediately causing the stock to fall 20%. We'll take a deep dive into each of his allegations. While Evergrande's assets had grown tremendously, so had their debts. And while they were reporting net profits, their operating cash flow was negative almost every year since 2006. That alone isn't necessarily a bad thing. Depending on how they book their revenues and expenses, it might be legitimate for their operating cash flow to be negative while their net profit is positive. But his next allegation was far more damning. He said that Evergrande uses off-balance sheet joint ventures to hide billions of RMB worth of debt and falsely classify it as equity. This is a bit complicated, so we'll explain it with an example. Evergrande wants to make a new development at a cost of $100 million, but they don't have $100 million of cash, so they find a partner to finance part of it. Evergrande will put up $51 million for a 51% stake in the project, while their partner will put up $49 million for a 49% stake. Let's say the property prices decrease by the time they finish the project, and they can only sell the development for $80 million. Because Evergrande only owns 51% of the project, they only incur $10.2 million of the loss, while their partner incurs the remainder. Because this is an equity joint venture, Evergrande wouldn't have to report the $49 million from the partner as debt. They have no contractual obligation to cover the losses for the partner if the development makes a loss. Left argued that Evergrande's JVs actually had a very different structure. They guaranteed a specific rate of return to the partner. For example, they might guarantee a 10% return, which means regardless of how the project turns out, the partner is entitled to $54 million from their original $49 million investment. If they only end up being able to sell the properties for $80 million, there will be only $26 million left for Evergrande after paying the partner. This is a much more risky proposition for Evergrande because they'll have to make a large loss if the development slightly underperforms their projections. It could be the case that the partners view Evergrande's developments as very risky, so they're only willing to put up capital if they can get guaranteed returns. Left argues that these joint ventures are really debt, but Evergrande falsely classifies them as equity so they can keep them off the balance sheet and make their leverage ratios look better. He said that these off-balance sheet debts added up to 23 billion RMB. 
This is eerily similar to Enron, which also had tens of billions of dollars worth of debt in a convoluted system of off-balance sheet vehicles. The next issue that Left brings up is allegations that Evergrande bribed government officials to get better deals when acquiring land. In their 2011 financial statements, they recorded $73 million worth of cost of land premium without official invoices. Left inferred that this means bribes. Evergrande bought land from local Chinese governments at a 67% discount to their peer group. They possibly bribed government officials to sell them state-owned land in an uncompetitive process at below market prices. They also allegedly pulled bait and switch tactics, where they would sell properties under development to home buyers. Once the property was complete, it looked significantly different from what the buyers were originally promised. In some cases, their business practices resulted in protests, where Evergrande's private security personnel got physical with protesters. Left argues that the Chinese government could eventually force them to forfeit their illegally acquired land. That would destroy Evergrande's business, as they would still retain the debt that they used to buy the land. Left also said that Evergrande's heavy reliance on pre-sale down payments resembled a Ponzi scheme. They desperately needed cash to make interest payments and contractually obligated payments to their JV partners. To fund this, they needed to book an ever-increasing amount of pre-sales. This led them to desperately take on unattractive projects with poor economics, such as a large development in Yingko City which already had a glut of residential housing. Evergrande's founder and chairman goes by the title Dr. Hui, and their corporate website says that he is a professor at the Wuhan University of Science and Technology. You may also see him referred to as Xu Jiayin, which is the Mandarin pronunciation, but they're referring to the same person. You might be surprised to hear that he does not have a PhD, and was in fact never a professor at any university. They could legitimately claim he is an entrepreneur and self-made billionaire, so it's quite strange that they felt the need to call him a professor as well but it just goes to show how willing Evergrande is to stretch the truth to make themselves look better. The last piece of Citron's report talks about some absurd non-real estate related ventures that Evergrande has taken on, which burn cash and destroy shareholder value. The company bought a professional soccer team in China and paid the players 70 million US dollars per year. This is multiples higher than what other soccer teams in the country pay. They also spent more than 100 million dollars to build the Evergrande football school, which they used to train and recruit new players. Needless to say, this is a cash incinerator. Based on the evidence put forward in this short report, Left said that the company was running out of cash and would face a liquidity crisis within the next few years. What he failed to consider was that as long as China's real estate prices kept inflating and sentiment remained strong, they could continue building new assets to offset their existing liabilities for many years to come. And that is exactly what they did. After the short report, the stock increased as much as sixfold at its peak in 2017. But with Evergrande now on the brink of bankruptcy, it appears that the chickens have finally come home to roost and Left was proven right in the end. The Hong Kong financial authorities did not take kindly to Left's allegations. With Evergrande being a Hong Kong listed company, they launched a market misconduct investigation into his short report. They said that the short report resembled a tabloid and Left did not do sufficient due diligence to verify his allegations in the report, nor did he have a complete understanding of the Hong Kong accounting standards. After the report was released, Many of the investment banks covering Evergrande stock said the claims were false, and the dip in the stock price was a buying opportunity. The authorities also found that Andrew Left started covering his short position almost immediately after his report was published, ultimately making a profit of 1.5 million Hong Kong dollars. In 2016, they found him guilty, fining him millions of Hong Kong dollars and banning him from trading Hong Kong listed stocks for five years. In rendering its decision last week, this Hong Kong tribunal said, and I quote, Mr. Left consciously disregarded the real risk that his report was false and misleading as to material facts. He was reckless in his conduct. What's your reaction today? I don't think I was reckless in my conduct at all. Scott, if you look at that report, it's extremely well sourced. It's well documented. Everything is right there. Their accounting, in my opinion, was Ponzi-like accounting, <clears throat> taking from one person to pay back the person beforehand. Uh, and Right now, looking backwards, it probably wasn't the best idea to write an article on, I think it's the largest property developer in China. Uh, that being said, you can't take away the truth. Uh, Hong Kong has made conscious efforts right now to curb short selling, uh, to also curb any kind of criticism within the market uh, that I was giving. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of the fact that I went ahead, I stood by it, I spent a lot of money on legal fees to fight it. I think the media has been very fair in understanding the fact that Hong Kong is trying to. Uh, suppressed my freedom of speech. That report had a hundred different points in it. 
and they picked out a few that they thought can be easily uh, tried in a court, and they were really accounting issues, and that's what they stayed focused on. Oh, of course I want to appeal, but, uh, you know, they say if you can't fight City Hall, it's pretty, fight the, pretty difficult to fight Hong Kong City Hall. And I just don't want to be in that situation. If, although I do believe what I wrote was correct, but more importantly than being correct, what I wrote was sourced, documented, and was my opinion. And in order to have a fair and open market, you must allow people to express their opinions. At the end of the day, Evergrande's financials were too complicated for anyone to definitively prove that they were committing any fraud. There can be many different interpretations of the accounting standards, and Evergrande vigorously defended themselves. And this also goes to show how difficult activist short selling is. Whenever you end up being right in the end, things can take many years to play out. Alright guys, that wraps it up for this video. Do you think Evergrande was a fraudulent company? Do you think they can survive their current cash crunch? Let us know in the comments section below. As always, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Wall Street Millennial, signing out.